The event which took place on this holy mount, which we call Mount Tabor, was a very beautiful thing, as you can imagine. Our Lord shows his three faithful apostles some of his glory. He chose out of the 72 disciples that he had and the 12 apostles, only three to be witness of this miracle. Why? Well, because he transfigured himself before them and showed them some of his glory because those were the three apostles who needed to have their faith strengthened. St. Peter would be the head of the church and the vicar of Christ on earth. So certainly he must be strong, fortes, in fide, strong in the faith. And then there was James. He was to be the first martyr, dying, shedding his blood for the faith of Jesus Christ. And then there was St. John, whose gospel was a defense against all those heretics in the early centuries who denied the divinity of Christ. And he could say to each one of them, I saw it. I was on Tabor. And there our Lord, his face became bright as the sun and his garments white as snow. And then there was a cloud covering and I heard a voice coming out. It was God the Father saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And then Moses and Elias came back from the Old Testament to give testimony to the divinity of Christ. Their faith surely was strengthened. But the miracle in this gospel today was not the transfiguration. Did you ever stop and think about that? The miracle was not in that he showed his glory to the apostles because that is his normal state, the state of glory. The miracle was that for 33 years he was able to hide that glory from being seen. That was a true miracle that lasted 33 years. But in any case, going to the gospel, the gospel on the first Sunday of Lent was read to us in order to urge us, to push us forward to use this time of Lent well. We know it's a great season of grace. We shouldn't waste any of it. And it is meant as a time to cleanse ourselves from the stains of sin, to overcome temptation, no longer to play around with it, but to avoid its occasions like the plague. It is a time for the destruction of sin in our souls. But today's gospel for the second Sunday of Lent tells us that we must not simply be satisfied with merely avoiding sin, with merely keeping ourselves out of the state of mortal sin. That's not enough. But this, sadly, is the attitude of many Christians in our own day and age, that it's enough to keep myself out of mortal sin, and if I do fall... Well, then I'll just go to confession and try not to commit it again. But to go any farther than that, very few have the, that attitude. But I guess a good example is this. Imagine two married people. They both have the, only the same attitude. Well, I just won't offend my spouse. I won't offend them. So I won't say anything nasty, but I won't say anything good either. Mm, I won't leave the toilet seat, seat up, but I'm not going to put it down, you know, clean it and all of that stuff. You're always seeking to, to just avoid what's going to offend rather than to do what will please. If that's the attitude in any relationship, it's not going to be a good relationship at all. And the same in the spiritual life. If our only attitude is to avoid mortal sin and to reduce 
Catholicism and the commandments to a series of thou shalt nots, and this thing is forbidden and so is that, well then, you're not going to do very much in the way of your sanctification. You must see your faith, the commandments, as not so many thou shalt nots, but as many thou shalt to give the opportunity to please the one whom you love, and that is God himself. We must become more and more like unto Christ, and more and more we must strive after perfection. Many lay people think that perfection is merely for the priests and the monks and the sisters. But perfection is for every one of us according to his state in life. And God has marked from all eternity, has marked a certain degree of perfection that he intends each and every one of us to reach. He has marked it out from all eternity. And he has destined you for a certain height of glory in heaven. Never forget that. Now, the first condition, and this is really the only condition I'll talk to you about today, as we seriously look at ourselves this Lent and our souls, and we try to get ourselves out of that mindset that, well, it's enough if I just don't commit mortal sin. No, no, no. We want to say, I'm going to renounce myself and I'm going to follow in our Lord's footsteps to the highest mountain of perfection, which is that of Mount Tabor, where I will see the glory of God for all eternity. The condition, the number one condition for having this good attitude is that of purity of intention. Now, purity of intention is very simple. It is the quality in all of our actions, in all of our omissions, our thoughts, our wishes, our desires, our words, etc., which directs all of these things Godward, heavenward. That is what purity of intention is. St. Paul says that the first words of our Lord in the moment of his conception, remember, he could speak. He had the perfect use of reason, even upon birth. But in the moment of conception, St. Paul tells us, our Lord's first words were, Behold, I come to do thy will, O God. That is purity of intention. Behold, the whole reason why I am here is to do the will of Almighty God. And then when he was born and grew up, and began his apostolic mission, he says to his apostles, I have meat to eat which you know not. I believe he said that at the Samaritan woman at the well, that whole gospel scene that we'll read in just a, a couple more weeks on a Lenten Friday. They ask him if he's hungry. He says, I have a meat to eat which you know not the will of God. And when all was dark in his life and the passion was beginning, what were his words? Our Lord's words were, Father, not my will, but thine be done. Simple. He directed it all Godward. Though as man he felt the worst sufferings imaginable. He was about to be taken and scourged and tortured and crucified as a criminal. He had all of the internal sufferings, the weight of the sins of all the world, of all men, of all ages, and sadness unto death. And yet, his only intention was not the ego, the me. His intention was the glory of God. Father, not my will, but thine be done. Nothing was more important to Christ than doing his Father's will. And it is in this point 
that our Lord asks us to follow him. St. Paul tells us, whatsoever you do, do all things for the glory of God. There it is in a sentence, that purity of intention. Whatever you do, if you pour a cup of cold water and give it to someone who's thirsty, if you take recreation, when you're getting dressed and ready to go out the door in the morning, when you eat some of your favorite snacks, whatsoever you do, do all things for the glory of God. For everything in this life becomes worthless if it is not done to please God. And the more we consider our last end, the more we are able to see the importance of having this mindset. So, for example, there is a story of a certain subdeacon in history. I can't recall his exact name, but he was set to be ordained. But after he was ordained to the subdiaconate, which is the step in which they take, the cleric takes a vow of chastity, and in which he can no longer go back into the world. He is bound to recite his breviary, bound to chastity, and many other duties. After he was ordained a subdeacon, he became ill, and so ill that he was no longer uh, suitable to receive holy orders. He was not allowed to be ordained a priest. For quite some time he rebelled at this idea. But then finally, as he reflected on his last end more and more and prayed for the graces that he needed, he said that sometimes it is better to be a host on the altar of God than it is to be a priest at the altar of God. It's a beautiful thought. Or we think of Pope Pius X. Did you know that when he was elected to be the Pope, he did not think he was going to be elected. He did not think at all that he stood a chance of being elected. In fact, he had his housekeeper back in wherever he lived, whatever town he lived in, keep things ready for him. But he never would come back because the Holy Ghost chose him. It says that when he found out he had been elected, he walked into the chapel and sat down in the pew and there with his head down in his hands, he broke down into tears because he wanted nothing more than to return home. He did not want the weight of the pontificate upon him. But then his best friend, who would later become his, his uh, secretary of state, Cardinal Mary del Val, who was a very saintly man, when he came in, he went right up to Pope Pius X and he looked at him. And they had quite a nice conversation. But finally, Cardinal Mary del Val said, Your Holiness, it is the will of God for you. That very instant, he stopped his crying and he stood up firmly and said, you are right, it is the will of God. And he went in and thus began his pontificate. That purity of intention that the saints had, that even if they had to go against everything that they wanted in life, provided it glorified God, that's all that concerned them because only by glorifying God will you ever get the chance to see what these three apostles saw on Mount Tabor. What is it that interferes and makes this so hard, this purity of intention? Well, it's that fallen human nature which makes us only think about me. It's all about me, as the saying goes. And so difficulties enter, and temptation comes, and you only think about satisfying yourself. And then when spiritual dryness comes into your prayers, you're all ready to give up because why? Perhaps it's not because you're worried that you're doing something wrong that's displeasing to God, but you're thinking, 
I no longer find satisfaction in my prayers. And now I must think about someone outside of myself and you give up. It's the I, the ego, that gets involved. And that's why the purity of intention becomes so hard. But those who learn to live with purity of intention rise above every storm, no matter what cross comes into their life, even though they have the most bitter internal sufferings, are able to stay calm and collected because their only intention and all that they do and think and wish for is to glorify Almighty God. Let us then study Christ in the Gospels. Let us learn and see how he always sought the will of God and to what great lengths he followed it, even to that of Mount Calvary. Let us imitate this purity of intention of the sacred heart of Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.